Welcome guys to part 3 of my documentary series on the First Punic War. This episode is going to be entitled, Sea of Blood. So we pick up the story after the fall of Agrigentum. As we saw, Rome was victorious in this endeavor, however she did come pretty close to failure, and we'll talk about this real briefly. So Rome's problems during the siege was that it was a very long siege, it was a costly siege, and Rome actually came very near failure due to the starvation of her legions and poor supply problems when she was operating outside of the Italian peninsula. So after the fall of Agrigentum, this convinces Rome that she needs to expand her war aims. Predominantly this means that Rome needs to invest in a massive fleet. Now the reasons for this are twofold. First. Having a fleet ensures that Rome will be able to strangle the island of Sicily. She can thus blockade coastal cities and facilitate the total and more hasty besieging of such cities. Also, having such a fleet will allow Rome to ensure her supplies make it from Italy over to Sicily. This is going to be very important because the mighty legions are an army marching on their stomach. Now, in the grand scheme of things, the fall of Agrigentum is going to cause a morale blow amongst the ranks of the Carthaginian military and most importantly it's going to cause many cities to waver and switch sides so they're going to be switching from sort of Carthaginian sided cities over to the Roman side because they're in awe of what Rome has achieved and this is going to be something that's pretty indicative of the way the campaign will go in Sicily many towns are going to have to be conquered but after a certain battle, maybe at sea or on land, you'll see certain cities waver. And so one way to control the island would be to control it through perhaps a, you can think of it as a power meter, or who's doing best in the sense of morale and the sense of total achievement. Another way that cities would have been traded would have been in sieges. As I've said, sieges would probably be the most dominant effect on the island. There wouldn't be many set piece battles. And so after this victory, Rome is not necessarily going to have complete victory just because she beat the enemy army. She still has to go and conquer each and every city after the fall of Agrigentum. Now, these cities, as I said, could be sieged, but another way that they could, you know, switch sides would be if certain political entities inside of them decided to open up the gates for Rome or open up the gates for Carthage. And so we see a lot of acts of betrayal and treachery. During this conflict in Sicily, there are going to be a lot of back and forth, some smaller engagements, however the set piece battles that I noted are going to be predominantly the Battle of, of Agrigentum. However, notably there is a surprise attack led by Hamilcar Barca, and we'll see this later on in this video, where he kills 4,000 Syracusans at Thermae. In any case, Carthage during this conflict has more permanent commanders, which gives her a little bit of an edge, while Rome has to have constant cycling of leadership in the form of consuls, but she does have permanent reinforcements, so that's a bit of the trade-off, and so Rome has more determination when it comes to supplying fresh troops, and Carthage has a more consistent leadership. Now at this point in time, the Punic naval squadrons are still very active, and they're going to be actually raiding up and down the Italian coast. This type of small-scale action would continue throughout the war. In 260 BC, the massive new Roman fleet sets sail. The consuls for the year are Naelius Cornelius Scipio, who commands the fleet, and Caius Duilius, who commands the land forces in Sicily. Now Scipio is going to sail ahead with 17 of his ships to prepare logistical support for the arrival of this massive fleet at Masana. However, as he approaches Masana, he gets word that there has been a plot for the betrayal of the Carthaginians who are holed up in Lipara. Now Lipara was a strategic base located on the islands to the northeast of Sicily. As I've said, betrayals were pretty common in this period, and Scipio was eager to pounce on this opportunity and gain an early victory. What happens now is he decides to grab his 17 ships and quickly sails them to occupy the harbor at Lipara. Carthage, however, is operating nearby in Panoramis and she is going to have her fleet ready. The commander is going to be Hannibal, who is the general who escaped Agrigentum at night, and he swiftly dispatches his quickest 20 ships. This squadron arrives and is able to cage in the Romans. The inexperienced Romans offer no resistance and many of them flee inland. Scipio is captured, and his fate, we believe, 
would have been to either be released or ransomed or perhaps exchanged in sort of a prisoner exchange between the two powers because he does recur in our history later on. However, this is a very humiliating defeat for Rome right off the bat. This was perhaps a disaster or maybe an ingenious and clever trap. So as I said, because these betrayals were pretty often, perhaps commanders would have sought out to have fake betrayals and thus provide this kind of trap. Now, this wasn't uncommon or unheard of. I'll give you a quick anecdote. So, for example, in Sicily, there was a Carthaginian commander who was said to have disposed of a group of mutinous Gauls under his command by sending them to attack a Roman-held city which the Carthaginian commander claimed had been betrayed to them. So the Gauls set off, smiles on their faces, believing that this city would open its gates to them, and they could then turn on the population, plunder it, and have all of this gold and booty to themselves. However, the town folk were made aware of their approach by Punic agents pretending to be deserters. The Gauls were thus massacred as they walked into an ambush. Soon, however, Carthage would suffer her own setback. She had 50 ships on a reconnaissance mission when they bumped into the entirety of the Roman fleet. Now, this was not unheard of and is not due to just poor judgment on Hannibal's part. This is something that is going to recur throughout the campaigns here. It's because of the poor intelligence of these fleets and the fact that they stayed relatively close to land and also the fact that the shoreline was relatively meandering. This meant that you couldn't necessarily see what was around the bend. So in any case, the 50 ships led by Hannibal are going to be hugely outnumbered by the entire Roman armada. Neither side is particularly prepared for the conflict. However, a majority of the Punic vessels are going to be lost in this engagement before their better seamanship allows them to turn about and outrun the Romans. Now even though the Romans had won, they realized that they were outclassed and they realized that they needed to do something to change this because the ease with which these Carthaginians were able to disengage from the fight and thoroughly just outrun the Roman vessels. Both fleets, however, would soon meet again head on, and this time more than luck would have to carry the day. Rome realized after that last engagement that she couldn't rely on her poorly trained navy to win the traditional engagement at sea, which was often won by superiority in maneuvering and ramming, which the Carthaginians definitely had. Instead, Rome had to somehow rely on what she was good at, and that was close quarter combat. So Rome needed to turn what was a naval battle into a land battle. Thus we see the development of the Corvus. This is going to be an extremely, extremely important invention that allows Rome to achieve her aims of turning naval battles into land battles. However, sadly, its inventor is lost to history. The Corvus is essentially a boarding bridge in the shape of a Y, 4 feet wide, 36 feet long, and at the base of this Y is going to be a long groove, which allows it to slot around a pole and swivel. Pulleys allowed the crew on a ship to raise and lower the Corvus. A large spike was then attached to the underside of the tip of the Corvus. This meant that the bridge, the boarding bridge, was top heavy. And when you released the Corvus and it swung down, it had great piercing power. It could dig into the top of enemy decks and secure a crossing for the marines on board Roman vessels. And they could pour over and swarm into enemy vessels and take out the crew. Thus outfitted with their new invention, the Romans were ready. Soon Caelus Duilius hears that the Carthaginian navy is active off of northern Sicily. Reports indicate that the Punic fleet is raiding in the area around Miley. The entire Roman fleet sets out, and Hannibal, hearing word of this, prepares for their approach. The Romans number about 120 ships, while the Carthaginians are said to sail around 130 vessels. Hannibal himself led the charge in his Hepteres, this flagship. Though confused about the strange new look of the Roman vessels, he remained supremely confident in the superiority and the numbers and the skill of the fleet at his back. The Carthaginian forces surged after their commander, making a beeline for the Romans. The lead ships rammed into the Roman ships, however as soon as they did, the Roman sailors swung their corvi in place, the top heavy bridges smashing their beaks into the Punic decks and sailors streaming across. The Punic sailors were caught totally by surprise. They were used to disengaging quickly and now here they were paralyzed, being stormed by fierce Romans.
In this way, the 30 Punic ships at the vanguard of the assault were seized. Hannibal and his own flagship were boarded. Humiliated, he was forced to escape in the back of the ship in a small rowboat. Seeing this new, bizarre threat, the Carthaginian ships now moved to assault the flanks. They thus hoped to avoid the corvi. In response, however, the Romans were able to maneuver to face this new threat. This was done either by repositioning ships from the main line or sending in extra ships they may have held back in a possible second line. The Corvus proved essential in keeping at bay the Punic ships. Historian Polybius recounts how the boarding bridges, quote, swung around and plunged down in all directions, end quote. As a result, 50 Carthaginian ships were lost to boarding. Unable to use the superior speed of their ships to slip past the Roman Corvus defenses, they now used that speed to perform a hasty retreat. Rather than give chase to the remaining 80 Punic ships that were quicker than his own vessels, Duilius sailed to Sicily to relieve the city of Segesta from Carthaginian land forces which had been besieging it. The Roman victory was resounding. Duilius came home to celebrate the city's first naval triumph, and then the festivities, the speaker's platform in the forum was even decorated with the prows of captured ships. These prows, known as rostrata, are what give the platform the name today of the rostra. Hannibal was humiliated, and was later executed by his own officers after continued failures while in command of the fleet. Carthage retained her naval pressure through raiding and blockading, but largely avoided direct confrontations with Roman ships for three years. Meanwhile, the Roman fleet acted in support of the legions in Sicily and was freed to help the engagements on land. Roman forces on the north of Sicily pushed forward along the coast. However, they were repulsed by Carthaginians at Thermae in 260 BC. Roman troops operating out of Agrigentum in the south made their own, more successful advances. The cities of Segest and Mechella, which had been besieged by Carthage after revolting against them, were relieved when they saw legions appearing and breaking off these sieges. However, in 259, Carthage made a counterattack, bold through the center of the island seizing both Enna and Camarina. The next year, this ping-pong back when Rome took back these cities and pushed further inland, grabbing Midas Stratton. In 257 BC, fate would force an engagement at sea. Both fleets were operating off northern Sicily by Tindarus this time, when they came into sight of each other, virtually bumping into each other. As I said, and as we saw that this happened before, such encounters were not uncommon at the time. Neither side was formed up and ready for battle. Yet Caius Attilus Regulus, who was the consul attached to the Roman navy for that year, decided to brazenly gather up a dozen of his most prepared ships and charge forward, leaving the rest of his fleet behind. The swift Punic vessels, however, rapidly were able to come about and turn to face this new threat. Overwhelmingly, they descended on the exposed Romans, sinking all but the consul in his flagship. By this point, the fleets were drawing nearer and closer. Rome's reinforcements were able to catch her 10 of these Punic ships and sink another 8, which had themselves strayed too far in their pursuit of the consul. 
The Punic fleet withdrew to the safety of their base at the nearby Lipari Islands before a full-scale engagement could develop. They were a little afraid, given how the last conflict had gone, and given the evening up of their losses here, they decided to cut their losses as they were and seek safety. However, both sides continued to throw massive resources behind their forces to gain a decisive edge in the next encounter. The Romans became fed up with the slow progress of the war in Sicily, and in 256 BC they decided to significantly raise the stakes of the war by planning an invasion of North Africa. They prepared 330 ships and amassed them for the occasion. These vessels sailed down the Italian coasts, gathering supplies, and were headed down past Syracuse to rendezvous with the legions in Sicily. The most experienced troops would be picked up from the army and serve as marines and lead the invading force. The conquerors were now saturated with complements of 120 hardened soldiers on their decks. This caused Polybius to put the combined strength of this Roman fleet at 140,000 men. The Roman initiative was so important that both consuls were with the fleet. The men were Lucius Manlius Vulso and Marcus Attalus Regulus brother of the commander we had just heard of at Tendaris. They had decided to set to sea and sail directly for Africa or crush any resistance thrown in their path. With this plan in mind, the fleet was now escorting a contingent of horse transport, which would supply around 500 cavalry and mounts for the officers. The Punic command judged that the best way to repulse this invasion was to stop it in its tracks at the Sicilian coast. They marshaled a grand fleet, which Polybius puts at 350 ships and estimates at 150,000 men. If these numbers are to be believed, then it would have been the largest force ever put to sea by Carthage. The fleet left Africa to rendezvous at Lilibaeum before sailing to meet their enemies. Both titanic forces met off the coast of Ignomus. Let's now turn our eye to the game plan of both sides. The Roman commanders first divided their fleet into four squadrons. Together, they would form a compact triangular formation. The consuls themselves stood at the very tip of the fleet in their flagships. Marcus Regulus commanded the head of the first squadron, while Lucius Volso commanded the second. Each ship deployed behind their commander in an echelon formation, side to side, staggering backwards. The third squadron, carrying the horse transports, was aligned abreast at the base of the triangle. Protecting the rear of the fleet was the fourth squadron, nicknamed the Triari. Tactically, this deployment played off the strengths of the Corvus. The dense ships could more readily present a formidable wall of these devices. In close proximity, multiple vessels could be used for quickly overcoming attackers with boarding parties. The triangular formation also allowed the Romans to face attacks from the sides. This was most likely an innovation after previous battles where Carthage had attempted to go around the flanks of the Romans. Carthage, on the other hand, relied on her speed and superiority at ramming. Consequently, they formed a massive line that greatly outflanked the Romans. The right wing was commanded by Hanno, the general who had been defeated outside the walls of Agrigentum in 261. The center was led by Hamilcar Barca, overall commander of the forces in Sicily and future father of the famed Hannibal Barca. He planned to break apart the tight Roman formation by ordering his own ships in the center to retreat as the Romans advanced so as to draw them out in the center. Meanwhile, his divisions on the flanks would drive in from the sides and rear thus avoiding a frontal attack on the Corvus armed Roman ships. This strategy is vaguely and ominously familiar to the strategy that would later be employed by his son at Cannae. The engagement began in the center of the battlefield.
Punic center was able to draw the Romans in with initial success, but found it hard to perform a controlled retreat as was intended. The Corvus armed Romans were too formidable from the fronts and again were able to grapple and board ships that strayed too close. Under such conditions, the Carthaginian ships lost cohesion in their evasive maneuvers and turned to flight. Meanwhile, the flanking Punic ships were encountering much greater success. The right Punic flank hit the Triarii from the side and were able to start using greater mobility to get around the Corvi. The Punic left flank descended on Rome's 3rd squadron, which had become separated, when the lead Roman formations charged forward and the Triarii became engaged. This 3rd squadron, which had been towing the horse transports, was forced to cast these adrift as they were forced back by the Punic assault. The 3rd squadron sought to negate the Punic advantage of mobility by falling back to the coast. There they formed a line with their fronts and corvi facing the Carthaginians and their rears were covered by the shore. Once again, the Corvus proved to be an invaluable asset in keeping the Punic ships at bay, and keeping them from making headway in a direct assault. At this point, Regulus gathered up as many of his ships as he could from the center and wheeled back to support his fleet. Romans thus descended on Hanno's forces, which had been confronting the Triarii. Manlius Vulso then returned with the rest of his ships and struck a double blow with Regulus on the rear of the Punic ships by the shore. It's in these final, decisive moments that the most damage was dealt. Perhaps one of the largest naval battles in history saw Rome as the victor. Accounts claim that Carthage had 64 of her ships captured and 13 sunk. Rome, on the other hand, did not lose a single ship to boarding, but lost 24 to ramming. These statistics speak to the effectiveness of each navy's tactics. Evidently, the Corvus and boarding tactics proved to claim more ships overall than ramming did, even if we tally the combined casualties due to ramming for both fleets combined. Perhaps such large-scale battles were more suited to the simplicity of the strategy employed by the Romans. Boarding opportunities were sure to be plentiful with such huge numbers of vessels, whereas the ability to maneuver, ram, and retreat safely was more perilous. The role of the Roman consuls, however, cannot be neglected. Their strategy effectively accentuated Rome's advantages at sea and their quick and decisive rallying of the 1st and 2nd squadrons to relieve the 3rd and 4th helped secure victory where there may have been defeat. The Punic fleet scattered in all directions, leaderless. The Romans returned their forces to Sicily. The men rested from the battle and set about repairing their ships. Soon they would be ready. Soon the Armada would sail unopposed for Africa. Thanks guys, that's going to be it for this part. Tune in next time as we cover the invasion of Africa.